have uh, two sessions. The first one is uh, by Professor C.P. Chandrasekhar from JNU. Uh, again, he needs no introduction really. All of us know his work. Uh, his work on uh, industry was started off as an industrial economist and has worked on issues of finance, you know, India's connections with uh, global capitalism. Uh, and he's also one of the leading commentators on Indian economy. Uh, we read his essays uh, in various newspapers and frontline and so forth. So let's listen to him on international finance in India. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, uh, some of you are familiar and uh, since I have only half an idea, you'll see something which, is, uh, which you've possibly heard of before, so my apologies. But um, yeah, what I thought I'd do is uh, really try and examine uh, some changes which have uh, uh, occurred in, in terms of India's relationship with uh, global finance uh, and in particular its implications for the kind of regime of accumulation we've had uh, domestically. That in, in some sense how has the nature and the volume of access of India to international finance or international liquidity which um, as you know is the most fungible of all assets because you can convert it into any commodity you want and therefore uh, basically allows you to maintain some degree of disjunction between the pattern of domestic consumption, both final consumption and productive consumption, and the pattern of production, uh, because of the fact that you can close that gap without much difficulty through imports if you have access to, to foreign finance or to international liquidity. And therefore to look at uh, how the changing relationship of India to international finance uh, has a has not determined but has affected or influenced the kind of regime of accumulation we've had in this country. Um, just two minutes. Yeah, as you know, um, if you go back and you know, you read uh, uh, early discussions on India's post-independence -in development trajectory, or you read people like Kidron, who was one of the early persons to analyze uh, the role and nature, the nature and role of foreign investments in India. Uh, the perception at that point of time was that uh, that uh, independence may it meant that there was a certain degree of hostility uh, of both uh, in the, the Indian state, of course, but also Indian capital vis-a-vis uh, -vis foreign capital. The idea was that there was this this hostility, which essentially arose from the notion, uh, as far as Indian capital was concerned, that it had not received uh, the kind of space and freedom that it deserved during the colonial period. And it was, it affected the Indian state in as much as there was a perception that uh, uh, freedom, uh, political freedom, could actually be consolidated in some sense only with economic freedom. And economic freedom required some degree of freedom from international finance or international capital at that point of time. So therefore, there used to be, there, there was this understanding and um, which uh, prevailed for quite some time that there was this, this, this hostility, which is an hostility which, in which there was no sort of fundamental disagreement between the state and private capital, that uh, hostility in which the state was hostile to foreign capital and domestic capital was hostile to foreign capital as well. Uh, but very quickly, uh, uh, we know that, uh, that, that to the extent that even to the extent that the rhetoric of hostility remained uh, to whatever degree it did, that in practice uh, this uh, desire to be to put significant checks on the entry and therefore exit, because one of the features of non-resident or foreign capital is that if you want it to enter, you must give it some degree of freedom for exit, because uh, they want to actually not merely take out their dividends or their interest or their rents or whatever it may be, but they want to have the right to be able to encash their assets and carry it abroad. Therefore, they must be given a certain degree of right to exit as well. So that when we speak of capital controls and such things uh, in any, in any uh, economy and of course in any developing economy, we are not really talking about foreigners who are permitted to enter because to the extent that you permit foreigners to enter, you would have maybe stronger restrictions with regard to exit, but there's a fundamental idea that you should be permit exit, maybe with some degree of lock-in, 
for a period of time, maybe with certain conditions, maybe with higher tax rates, whatever it may be. But you must have a degree of freedom with regard to exit as well. So as I was saying that quite early, uh, the rules began to change about the entry and exit of foreign capital. And uh, uh, the official reasons which were given, we know, is uh, when you go back, is that it was argued that, listen, in some sense, uh, a late industrializer um, uh, has a problem. Uh, it has a problem because of the fact that uh, uh, you don't have adequate capital, some people argued, which of course is a problematic argument. But you can say that you didn't have adequate capital available in foreign exchange terms, so that to the extent that you had to import capital and equipment from the global economy, you needed foreign exchange, which if you can't transform domestic goods into foreign goods, that the way in which you got access to foreign capital was essentially by allowing foreign entry, or foreign capital entry. The second thing is, uh, you know, it was being a late industrializer, it was pointless reinventing the wheel that you had adva the advantage of access to foreign technology and very often foreign technology didn't come just as technology. It came along or, or as part of a package as people like Kidron and so on argued at that point of time in which uh, capital came along with technology. So therefore, if you wanted access to the technology, you needed to permit access to the, to the finance so that while you had a large and uh, uh, very high share in total, of purely technical collaboration agreements between Indian and foreign capital, most, or not most, but many uh, of those technical collaboration agreements uh, had associated with them some degree of foreign financial collaboration because foreign investors said that if you want technology from us, we want to have some role in the operation of the company and therefore we needed some access to, to foreign technology. So it, was, it, so it was said that partly because you needed uh, for an exchange for import of capital and equipment and for technology payments and partly because you needed access to this technology which didn't come independent of the capital, you had to permit some degree of entry of foreign finance or foreign capital. It was not pure finance at that point of time. And therefore, there was a relaxation of the rules with regard to foreign direct investment which occurred quite early into India's development trajectory. Okay, And, and that we know. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you read Kidron, for example, um, there's a statement he has in one of his footnotes uh, made by Nehru in parliament uh, in which he basically declared that, listen, we, we need this capital, we can't do without it and therefore it's completely wrong to presume that India is hostile to foreign, foreign capital or foreign investment but rather we are willing to open our arms and this kind of a process carried on so that by the time you got to the early 1960s uh, after the second plan, uh, we saw uh, a substantial increase to the extent that foreign investors were willing to enter into the economy, a substantial increase in the number of uh, collaborations, the number of financial collaborations within that and of course the total volume of capital which was coming into the domestic economy. Okay? So therefore, you know, if you're really looking at a relationship between international and capital in India, I mean, I'm sorry, international capital in India or Indian capital or in the Indian state, then so it's something that we're talking about right from the point of time of independence. It's not that there was a period when we didn't have too much of access to international capital and technology and then suddenly in 1991 or 1980 or whatever it may be, you, you opened up and allowed this capital to come. However, we do know, and that's not since the early part of this period is not really the focus of my discussion, we do know that, uh, that in the period which, let us say, extended from about 1947, 1951, when planned development began, till about, well, the mid-1970s at least, uh, much of the foreign capital, almost all of the foreign capital, which came into India had certain characteristics. I mean, one, of course, uh, it was not pure financial capital in a significant sense. We didn't have too much of portfolio inflow. Uh, we had a significant amount of debt inflow, but a large part of the debt inflow was in inflow which occurred through the development aid network. It came in the form of multilateral or bilateral aid and it came to the state. Not much of it came to the private sector. Uh, by aid, we don't mean aid in the sense, uh, sense only of grants. It was dominantly, of course, as in most countries, in the form of debt. So there was, there was a chunk of capital which came into the country in the form of foreign debt which came through the development aid network and there was very little capital which came as debt 
through the private commercial channel uh, to the extent that we had debt which was coming through the private commercial channel it essentially was in the form of trade credit or you know what what when you went into the balance sheets of indian companies in particular companies which had foreign co collaborators it was trade credits or sundry debtors or sundry creditors of different kinds who basically provided capital on a short term basis for you to be able to make your imports of, of raw materials of intermediates maybe uh, spares and some capital equipment so the uh, so there wasn't any significant inflow in the form of private debt much of it debt flow was in the form of uh, of uh, uh, public, I mean, or, or debt which came to the government sector through the development aid network. And of course, there was a certain amount of inflow which came, uh, or a significant amount of inflow which came in the form of foreign investment, of which the share of portfolio investment was extremely small. Uh, just for those of you who don't look at this kind of thing, uh, we need to recognize that what we called portfolio investment then and what we call portfolio investment today are very different things that uh, at that point of time, the definition which the Reserve Bank of India, which of course is the principal agency for collecting statistics on the flow of, of foreign capital into the country, was that the idea was that we had a notion of a foreign controlled rupee company, uh, of what in the statistics used to appear as FCRCs. And a foreign controlled rupee company in the definition adopted by the Reserve Bank of India, right up to 1991, was uh, any company in which there was a single foreign investor who, who, who held at least 25% of equity. Okay? So it had to be an industry in which the government will allow at least 25% of equity, either on a general basis or a case-by-case -case basis. And secondly, that 25% of equity had to be held by a single investor for it to be characterized as a direct investment. So the rest of the investment which came in to the... Uh, corporate sector essentially came in the form of uh, what was defined at that point of time as portfolio investment. So, dis you know, whereas if you compare it with, with the period after 1990 when India adopted the definition which is, uh, which is part of the IMF statistical system, that definition basically says that any entity in which there is direct investment of at least 10% or more of equity, inequity by a single investor is a direct investment company. So you had a significant change in the notion of what constitutes foreign direct investment between 1991 and earlier. But despite that difference where there was a more limited range of investors who were identified as direct investment, direct investors in the period before 1991, you ended up with a situation where Portfolio investment was not too large a share of total investment. So you had either pure technical collaborations or you had financial collaborations in which uh, investors most of, were most often investors who had at least 25% of equity. So they were foreign controlled rupee companies and it fell in the category of direct investment. Okay. So, uh, so as I said, so you had access, not, you didn't have very much access to debt, definitely not access to debt in the form of long-term borrowing from the international commercial market which went to the private sector. You had some sundry debt which was of sundry credits provided to the private sector. You had a certain amount of debt which came which is the large part of foreign capital inflow which came into the system as part of the development aid network in the form of multilateral aid through agencies like the like the World Bank, the IMF, subsequently the Asian Development Bank, etc. And then you had a significant amount of bilateral aid. A lot of that aid actually went into the public sector. In, in fact, an interesting thing is when, when the bank began its lending practices in countries such as India, uh, after they became independent, initially the, the sort of at least the, 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 the argument or the philosophy was that we shouldn't lend to the government, we should lend to the private sector, that the role of the bank or the World Bank is not to really go and lend to governments. But what you did see very soon, um, and definitely by the 60s, was the World Bank changing its position because it realized that if it wanted to influence policy domestically, it needed to lend to state agencies so that you began to see uh, a significant amount of public sector lending and by the bank and public sector lending which went into areas like uh, power generation, a whole lot of infrastructure sectors, etc., which is where the government wanted to get access to uh, foreign finance in order to make its investments, both from the point of view of just a sheer access to finance and more, more importantly, from the point of view of having access to 
foreign exchange, the liquidity which could be converted into any capital asset or intermediate or commodity which it wanted, okay. So, well, I've taken some time describing this, but why? If you look at this bundle in terms of the access to foreign capital which India had, there's one very obvious defining feature. That is, you didn't have access to capital on demand. That is, nobody in this country could pick up a phone, call some entity, international entity, and say that, listen, I want access to a few million dollars, to a few billion dollars, whatever it may be, and get access. It was de determined completely from the supply side. Foreign investors determined, decided whether they want to come into India or not. They came. But they decided whether they wanted to come into India or not. Bilateral and multilateral aid was determined by the aid giving decisions of bilateral and multilateral donors. So there could be times when you got a reasonable amount. There could be times when you suddenly were starved, as happened once India ran into its problems with, with the Indo Pak and Indo -China, China wars and so on. So that by the time you got to the late 60s, I mean, um, the, the mid 60s, um, foreign, you know, access to foreign aid began to dry up so much so that one analysis which we have by Srinivas and Narayana of the factors which were responsible for the post mid 1960s deceleration in investment in India basically said that that's because of the fact that we lost access to foreign, foreign, foreign aid and because you lost access to foreign aid and foreign finance you had a, a deceleration so it, it was a complete supply side argument explained by the fact that access to foreign exchange was determined from the outside okay right or wrong I'm not going into that I don't think it's right but 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 the point is there was adequate ground to be able to use foreign aid as a factor which could generate a supply side constraint to investment and growth. Okay? And, uh, and of course, if you uh, uh, take the sort of uh, little portfolio investment in debt, which the private sector got uh, in the form of uh, sundry credit or in the form of uh, portfolio investments into equity, which came for a number of reasons. Some of it even just came to be able to allow domestic firms to buy capital equipment from international capital equipment suppliers. I mean, foreign firms which are supplying capital would say that, listen, we'll give you, you, you can't afford to buy it, you don't have foreign exchange, government is facing a foreign exchange constraint after 57, we'll give you foreign exchange in the form of debt, or in some form of equity, and you just pay us back over a period of time. And so long as at some point of time we have the right to exit, we'll be able to, you know, to be able to convert this capital asset which we are selling to you, which we want to sell to you because we have, let us say, excess capacity in the international market and in lieu of which you give us some foreign equity. But, if you, but even that was supply side determined. It was determined from the supply side. So therefore, what, what we are basically saying is that if you look at a very long phase of post-independence history, you are really looking at a period in which access I mean, or, the, or, or India's relationship with international finance was largely, predominantly, that is, of course, you had to change your rules. You had to relax your rules, which you did over a period of time, to allow inflow, of course, determine the terms of inflow, but whether inflow occurred in those terms which you decided at different points of time to maintain at certain level was determined from outside. It was not something which you could determine on the basis of, it wasn't a demand-determined inflow of foreign capital into this country, which I think is something we should take account of, because any shift from that could have significant implications. Why? And after that I'll get on to my main presentation. The significant implication it can have is that one way in which if you go through the literature, uh, in one way you can, you can sort of uh, organize or interpret the whole discussion on the determinants of growth and deceleration or growth and stagnation in K and Raj's terms, whatever it is, you know, try and explain that whole, that whole uh, aspect or characteristic of Indian development uh, in the period right up to the 1980s is that in some sense this was an economy like many less developed economies with, uh, which, was, which started off as predominantly agrarian economies uh, with uh, inadequate development of the manufacturing sector and the capital goods industry uh, which therefore made you heavily dependent on imports the moment you tried to industrialize, was that these were economies which were in some sense doing, always doing a tightrope walk between two constraints. One of course, uh, the kind of constraint which was focused on by Kaleski and so on, was the agrarian constraint. That the amount of access that you had 
to surpluses from the agricultural sector in general, but in particular surpluses in the form of wage goods from the agricultural sector, determine the degree to which you can have non-inflationary growth in the non-agricultural sector. So you were always constrained that, that if you tried to have uh, uh, some rate of growth in the non-agricultural sector, Kaleski told us, which was in excess of some rate of growth, exogenously given rate, rate of growth, institutionally determined rate of growth of the agricultural sector, then you ended up with inflation and inflation forced you to cut back on the rate of growth so that there was a barrier which was set, you know, which in approximate sense was John Robinson's inflationary barrier, but its source was the agricultural constraint, which set a barrier to the rate of non-agricultural growth that you could have. And the other constraint, this whole literature argued, was the constraint which came from the balance of payment side, which, if you think about it, is really the binding constraint. Because if you have access to foreign exchange, which, if you agree with me, is a completely fungible asset, then even the agreement constraint doesn't matter because you can always convert this foreign exchange into agricultural commodities. So you can import your wheat, you can import your sugar, you can import your pulses, you can import your onions, whatever it may be, and keep growth growing in a non-inflationary sense so that, you know, no more is agriculture the binding constraint. The only binding constraint becomes foreign exchange, okay? But if you happen to be partly a foreign exchange constrained economy, you are tightrope walking these two constraints. On the, one, on the one side, you have the agricultural constraint, which determined the rate of non-agricultural growth. On the other side, you have the balance of payments constraint, which in a larger sense was the binding constraint. So that the fact that you had access to foreign exchange only depending upon decisions which are taken on the supply side, but not on demand, obviously made that constraint extremely important. It was a constraint which in some sense completely determined the maneuverability of a state which was actually trying to launch on a strategy of national development. Because if it tried to do things which actually resulted in a demand for foreign exchange which was in excess of the exogenously given inflow of foreign exchange and the foreign exchange earnings which came from exports, you ended up with a situation where that growth strategy ran up against a wall. Okay? So, so therefore, being an economy in which the foreign exchange constraint, I mean, or the foreign exchange access were determined from outside, from the supply side, obviously had a, a sort of dramatic implication even for the maneuverability of a now newly independent state with nationalist ambitions to be able to launch on a nationalist tra trajectory. You needed to find a trajectory which allowed you to get yourself the maximal rate of growth without running up against this constraint. So if you look at the Marlin Obus model, that's what it was. How can I, given my balance of payments constraint, actually work a strategy in which I can maximize my rate of growth? That was what that whole model was all about. That's why it became so influential in determining, uh, not because India was the Soviet Union and therefore this was the Feldman model which we adopted, that was the problem and therefore that was the, the, the kind of strategy we are looking for and that's why the model became so influential. So therefore you had, as I said, uh, this long period when you had this, this relationship in which the relationship with international capital or I mean uh, using it in a, in a very loose sense with international finance was so important for India even then. It's not that finance became international capital became important for India after you know 1980 or 1991 or whatever it is, international capital was deeply important for India in the period before that, but it was an importance in which recognizing the fact that your access to this capital was determined completely from the supply side, you had to be a state which fashioned a strategy which could maximize your rate of growth independent of that, that limitation in terms of your access to international liquidity and yet it being a strategy in which you didn't run up against domestic constraints in particular. There were many constraints, infrastructural constraints for example, but in particular against the agrarian constraint which would set an inflationary barrier to a growth process. Okay? So if you look at it, the regime of accumulation which you had at that point of time was in some sense completely fashioned, you could say, by the fact, maybe good fact, that you didn't have too much access to international finance because that allowed you to pursue that strategy which you, in a political economy sense, you wanted to pursue for other reasons. And that reason was that finally you cannot consolidate dom political freedom unless you consolidate domestic freedom. So looking for a strategy in which you can maximize growth 
without being dependent excessively on foreign finance and just using that much which you can get from the supply side plus from your export earnings was actually a good thing to do in a political economy sense. It was actually a part of a program in which you had to find yourself economic freedom. And of course, the more you could export, the more maneuverability you had, the less you could export and therefore that you could have debates which, which you know exist in the literature, did India, India, India neglect its exports because of export pessimism and so on and so forth. You could argue all of that, but you couldn't have said that, listen, I mean, you know, you should have just opened your doors to foreign capital and you would have been okay. The problem is whether you opened your doors or not, what came in would be determined from the supply side. And therefore, there was a limit to which you could get access and that was not a world in which there was this sort of free, unbridled, large-scale, cross-border movements of capital which were occurring and therefore, in some sense, you were doing the right thing. By pursuing an import substituting strategy, it's not that you were doing something ideological, you were doing something which was the only opportunity which developing countries which had become newly independent at that point of time had and therefore it is not at all shocking that every day, it's not that you had a bunch of fools sitting in governments in every third world country, that was all they could do and they were all trying to find the best way to do it and we thought the best way to do it was to follow a Mal and Obis type strategy which we had formulated by the mid-1950s and tried to pursue. Okay. Okay. Now, that gives me my point of departure. Is this something which remains remain true? I'd like to argue that in some sense, no. Things fundamentally changed in the 1970s and India's use of that opportunity began in the 1980s. Uh, uh, I think from the beginning of the 1980s, some people say from the middle of the 1980s. But in some sense, there is one benchmark for, you know, Many of us who sort of came into economics as young students uh, at that point in the 1970s, I mean 1981 was, was a major turning point in, in the way we perceived India. And why was it a, 19, a major turning point? Because 1981 was when India took its first big IMF loan. That is, in 1965-66, India faced a crisis, a balance of payments crisis, an inflationary crisis, that is, we ran up against those twin barriers I'm talking about. We ran up against the agricultural constraint, we ran up against the balance of payments constraint, so we had a double problem. We had huge inflation and we had a huge balance of payments crisis and we had to go to the, to the IMF and the World Bank, we had to devalue our currency. It was seen as a national shame that we had to do that. It was seen as something which was an affront to national pride. Here was a country which by then for a period of almost two decades had been trying to build its own independent economy and you had failed. You were now forced to go back on bended knees to get access to foreign finance and they had come and told you, please devalue your currency. The idea that you devalued your currency was actually seen as something which was, which was a national shame. As opposed to that, in 1981, if you go back and look at it, of course the world was in a, in, in a bit of a crisis. Why was the world in a bit of a crisis? Because of two oil shocks. In 1973-74, you had the first oil shock. 1979 to 81, you had the second oil shock. 150% increase in the prices of oil. If you were an, an oil importer who didn't, which didn't have access to too much, uh, you know, foreign exchange, foreign liquidity, you had a huge problem because you were running up against a major constraint. But India, at that point of time was not so badly off. Of course, we had a current account deficit. Of course, that deficit was going to widen. But, you know, by that time, we had, we had got one. The benefits of the, of the first oil boom, which was there was a migration trail of Indians, you know, carpenters, masons, drivers, nurses, doctors, some accountants, whatever it may be, who had all been migrating to the Gulf. So by that time, we had begun to see the remittance inflow coming in. Secondly, we had begun to see a change in our export pattern. We had begun to export more to the Gulf because of the fact there was an increase in demand for products from countries like India in the Gulf region where suddenly there are these huge surpluses, okay, foreign exchange surpluses. So, in part, what was a negative effect was also positive. We were not only losing out foreign exchange because oil prices were going up, we were also getting some foreign exchange because of the oil boom. But more importantly, that had triggered in in uh, the by, by, by the late 1970s and of course in the, through the first half of the 1980s, India's decision to go and discover first the, the sort of uh, 
the evidence already existed, the prospecting evidence already existed, but then we decided to try and exploit and flog, not just exploit, but flog Bombay High, so that India became a country which saw this dramatic change, which, you know, we can't even believe now. We started with, from a situation in which 65% of our POL, petroleum oil and lubricants requirement was imported, 35% was domestically produced. That change, it just reversed itself. By the time we got to the mid-1980s, 65 was being produced and sold from, from domestic sources, 35 was being imported. So if you look at 1981 and what happened after, there was, there was no dramatic crisis in India as there was in many other developing countries which were oil import dependent. But yet we know that in 1981, the government of India decided, at that point of time, there was no great access to the internet, there was no uh, transparency in international institutions or in governments to the extent that we, even to the extent that we have now, we know that we still don't have it in full. So therefore, when a government went and actually took a loan from the, in, from the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank, it took it on terms which are completely secret, which was not even open to its own parliament, let alone its citizens, okay, in, 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 a, in a direct way. But we know that in 1981, the government of India decided to take a large, at that point of time, one of the largest loans which had been taken by any developing country from the IMF, 5 billion SDR. And the argument was that, listen, even though we don't need so much immediately, taking this loan actually gives us access for, for the next three years to a line of credit, which gives the state extreme maneuverability. And we then are going to actually restructure our whole development trajectory so that we'd be in a position to be able to earn the foreign exchange, to restructure in particular in our industrial sector, but our economy as a whole, to earn the foreign exchange so that we can cover any import bill, including that additional import bill we'll now have to suffer or incur because of the hike in oil prices which had occurred as a result of the formation of the OPEC and the two oil shocks which had occurred in 1973-74 and 79-81. That is, there was a state of its own volition, unlike in the mid-1960s, which had decided to go and submit itself to the IMF and its conditionalities, which at that level of borrowing would be among the highest because you're, you're, you're getting to a tranche which actually put you on the highest level of conditionalities, which, is go, which had decided to go and submit it. It could, it could have even gone to the IMF and said, okay, give me a billion or give me, you know, 750 million or give me one and a half billion. And the conditions would have been very different from just going to the IMF and says, no, no, I don't need five billion just now, but give me five billion. Okay. In fact, finally, we didn't even use three billion. But you, you went, so it was the Indian state which went and did it. Now, if you look back at that now, at that point of time, of course, this was a story which was broken by a friend of some of ours, uh, Mr. Endram, who was the then young Washington correspondent of the Hindu, and he got a leak. He got a leak from one of the managing directors uh, of, the, of the IM, of the, I mean, of the, one of the directors of the, on the board of the IMF, and um, suddenly India knew the conditions or the terms on which we were actually getting access to this loan. And it was a scandal because we still were part of a nationalist trajectory. It was a complete scandal. I mean, there was a whole issue of what was then the, whatever, the outlook or the India Today of today, Sunday magazine, you know, Sunday magazine at that time was the magazine. And there was a whole issue which was just on India's IMF loan, which had all these radical economists from Ashok Mitra downwards through the Patnaiks and so on, writing about what a, what a great disgrace this was. And this was being put out not by some radical journal. It was being put out by a journal edited that time by M.J. Akbar, who was, a, who was a young editor, and basically saying this is a complete scandal. There were demonstrations, there were strikes, etc., etc. But basically, if you look back now, that was a turning point because what was the signal which the government was sen sending out? The signal the government was sending out was not so much that we are facing a crisis because of the oil price shocks. The signal it was sending out is that we are now in a world in which there is far easier and greater access to international liquidity and we are beginning to actually exploit that access to international liquidity 
by taking on a $5 billion SDR credit from the IMF, in lieu of which we are going to open up our economy, and opening up that economy is actually going to now give us access on demand to foreign liquidity from the private commercial market. Because we are going to change the rules for entry of this capital, and we are changing it in a world in which now there is a capital which we can access unlike in the period of the 50s and the 60s and the early 70s, which we could access only if they chose to, to give it to us, but which we now can access on demand. So, in some sense it appeared that, listen, our, our relationship with international capital in general and international finance had changed. That earlier they determined how much of fungible free foreign exchange uh, you know, access we had, now we could determine how much fungible free foreign exchange access access we want to get because we can pick up a phone literally call washington call you know the city of london call somewhere and actually call maybe tokyo and get access to this because now that flow was occurring now was there any basis for this shift was there any basis for this shift in perception of course there was a basis there were many things which happened leading up to the 70s, but particularly during the 1970s, which had changed the world of international finance. Okay? And the, 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 the thing which really uh, had changed, of course, was that uh, you had the oil shocks. Because you had the oil shocks, there was this fundamental change in the international balance of payments framework. Earlier you had the developed countries with surpluses, the oil exporters with small surpluses, and developing countries and other oil importers with large deficits. Suddenly you were in a world in which you had the developed countries with small surpluses or deficits, oil exporters with large surpluses and developing countries with huge deficits. And therefore, there was a recycling problem. You had to get those surpluses from the oil producers, exporters to the developing countries. But the oil exporters were basically saying that, no, no, we're not going to take it to the developing countries. A little bit we'll give you as aid and so on. Most of it was, I mean, part of it was spent domestically generating the boom in the Gulf region. But a large part of it we know, and I'm not going to waste my time giving you numbers, etc., went into the international banking system. And the banking system is an entity in which it cannot keep deposits idle because it, it pays to get deposits. Therefore, it must lend to get a higher rate of interest than what it pays. And it's the differential which actually determines its profitability. So suddenly you had the international banking system going out looking for people it could lend to because it had these huge surpluses coming in. Because the way, way the system is, is, is structured, you don't say no to deposits. If deposits come, you just take them so long as it comes within the rules of the deposit system. So therefore, initially, of course, there was a credit boom in, in, in the developed countries themselves. Suddenly, uh, people began to get uh, loans for housing, loans to buy automobiles, loans to just spend, loans to go to college. I mean, you know, you, you, you know it, was, it, was, it, was, it was a credit boom which occurred there. A credit boom generates demand. Therefore, you had a real a, a growth boom. A growth boom in energy-intensive societies increases the demand for energy. When the demand for energy went up, oil exports went up. When oil exports went up, more surpluses. More surpluses got deposited into the international system. That was not a way in which you could solve the problem. You had a double problem. You had to re recycle in a global sense, get money to the deficit developing countries, which are oil importers, and you had to get money out of those countries in which otherwise you're going to create this, just this continuous increase in liquidity. And this came on top of many things. It came on top of the fact that by that time, the baby boomer generation had saved money, the money lying with pension funds, which had to be invested, and pension funds normally, uh, within their own rules, tend to follow what the banks do. There was money which essentially came because the United States after the mid-1960s had begun to behave like a country which didn't have a national budget constraint. It had the reserve currency. It could just print the dollar or the greenback and spend. It spent it to police, I mean, it spent it normal, I mean, for, for what you would consider normal consumption. It spent it uh, to police the world. It spent it to finance the Vietnam War. The net result was there was a huge buildup of what were called euro dollars, but they were not just euro dollars, they were dollars which were located all over the world. So there was an increase in dollar liquidity because of that, and so on and so forth. There were, you know, so, so, you know, there was other factors which were increasing international liquidity, on top of which came the oil boom. And therefore, you needed to ensure that there was this flow of capital outside that system into the developing countries. And therefore, suddenly, 
the better of developing countries began to get discovered. The term hadn't yet come at that point of time, but began to get discovered in emerging markets or whatever you call them. And money first moved to Latin America because Latin America, particularly southern Kun countries in Mexico, were the countries that basically decided to exploit this opportunity first. So let's not forget the first debt crisis where there was excess exposure of the international private financial system to developing countries occurred in 1982. So you suddenly had this transformation where private capital never went to developing countries because they were not creditworthy and there was too much political risk to a situation in which they were willing to overexpose themselves in developing countries. And in 1982, when already they were getting a bit worried about their overexposure in Latin America, that was around the period of time in 1981 when India, through the signal it sends out by going to the IMF, accepting a high conditionality loan, says we are on the stage, we are coming to the table, we too want access to this demand determined foreign exchange which we, we can access on demand. Okay? So the, my story starts there, oh, my story starts there, okay? <laughs> you know, really if we take the period from 1980, are we talking of just this one period in which changes in the international financial system allowed India to adopt a response which I have not discussed to the crisis it was facing domestically, a crisis which at, at, at that point of time was still being identified by most people as a crisis of institutional change, your inability to be able to undertake institutional change of various kinds to be able to generate a strategy in which despite the fact that you were the tightrope walking between an agrarian constraint and a balance of payments constraint, you would be able to maintain a rate of growth which was reasonable or which was good or which was creditable, whatever it may be, that instead of going back and looking at that more carefully, you suddenly decided in 1980 to try and exploit the possibility that you can relax the binding constraint. You can actually create, I mean, get access on demand to this foreign exchange. Now, just as a, as a brief aside, it's not that the state at that point of time was not thinking about this. In fact, an interesting discussion in the political economy of India development is how do you interpret what, what was in some sense an interregnum? That by the mid-1960s, you knew, you knew that, you know, the strategy within the institutional framework, which you had implicitly, not explicitly, because, I mean, the first and second plans were full of land reform talk, but we hardly had any land reform. But what you had implicitly accepted, that you had actually run up against a crisis. But it's not that at that point of time, it's not, you know, you had a, you had a, I think Swaminathan committee, wasn't it? Which actually said we have to, not MS Swaminathan, there was another Swaminathan, who was a bureaucrat, and so on. Uh, you had those committees, but basically nobody was talking about liberalization as an alternative to the mid-1960s crisis. I mean, in fact, you would be laughed at if you spoke of liberalization because you will only worsen the crisis because you will just import more, you will have a larger balance of payments problem and, you know, at some point you are going to get knocked on the head by the bank or the IMF said that, listen, cut, cut short your growth, you know, cut short your domestic absorption, which means cut short your state expenditure and reduce the rate of growth. But what you did have was that you did have a perception emerging in which you are basically saying that, listen, we have not found the institutional framework in which we can pursue a strategy in which domestic demand, in particular state financed domestic demand and with a significant component of state debt financed domestic demand will constitute the principal stimulus to growth. That was the regime of accumulation which you were trying to follow and you ran up against the constraint which you did in the mid-1960s and you already had a crisis. So you really, the question was uh, at that point of time, okay, you, you can't liberalize, so are you going to go back and rethink of the fact that you didn't do any institutional change? And if you look at this interregnum, of course you didn't do land reform. There was still talk about land reforms, of course. In fact, a lot of the best literature on land reforms came after the mid-1960s. But the point is, uh, you did do certain things. Do we say that India actually decided to uh, nationalize banks in 1969? Dramatic, 
I mean, it's actually a politically a huge decision going by the politics of any developing country. Of course, and all developed countries put together. Developed countries, we now know, nationalize banks only when they have a banking crisis and then hand it back to the private sector. You don't go around nationalizing private banks. In 1969, we nationalized 14 of our major banks. You know, we virtually nationalized the whole of the banking system. We went and implemented in 1973 the two acts, the Monopoly and Restrictive Trade Practices Act, which means we said that we're going to come up, we might not be coming up against the landlords in a big way, but we're definitely going to come up against the big corporates, the monopolists, the big business houses in a big way. In 1969, we implemented FERA. We, you know, legislated and implemented FERA. I mean, in 1973, I'm sorry. Uh, legislated and implemented FERA, which meant that we are saying that, listen, we had a hostile rhetoric against foreign capital, but we let them have too much in this domestic economy. Now we're going to make them go back. We're going to get them down to 40%. Some of them went back. IBM went back. Coca-Cola went back when, when Ferrah was. Now, you can either say that these were a set of decisions which were taken basically because Mrs. Gandhi had a problem with the syndicate. Or you can say that this was an effort of Indian capital to try to find ways in which it would make some kinds of institutional compromises in order to be able to resolve the growth problem. The fact that your regime of accumulation had hit a major crisis. Okay? So, it's not that we didn't try. In a world in which you didn't have options, you actually did think in some sense about having some institutional change. Of course, we all say they didn't go far, far enough, far enough. Uh, they didn't put enough teeth into the MRTP Act and so on and so forth. But the point is, the whole mindset, the mindset was one of creating an institutional framework which was just about good enough to be able to deal with these twin constraints without running into a balance of payments crisis because you didn't have access on demand to foreign exchange. Okay? So, in some sense what we are saying is that this change was a big difference. It was a big difference because of the fact that now you were not stuck. Unfortunately, you were not stuck in that world in which you had to look to institutional solutions for your growth crisis for the crisis of your regime of accumulation. You, had, you thought you had another way of resolving that problem and which was at that point of time a straightforward way. Just go and access the international market for private debt. Mexico did it, burnt its fingers and has a crisis, but we are not Mexicans. We are brighter, you know, we've got Cambridge Return Economists and, you know, etc. So we're not going to make that mistake, but let's go and do it, even though, you know, by 1982 it was clear that you can, you can end up with a severe crisis if you did this kind of thing. Okay. So, if we take that period, when we had and exploited, by we, I don't mean us, I mean we, meaning the Indian state, had an Indian capital, had and exploited this opportunity to change the regime of accumulation because we had access to international liquidity on demand. The question I want to place today, in the, in the next 15-20 minutes, how, do I, how long I have? Uh, yes, that should be. Yeah. 15, 20 minutes is then what? Yeah, yeah, okay, 20 minutes. What? Huh? Finish your argument. No, no, but then yeah, I'd like to have some discussion. Okay. Start off. <laughs> no, no. So, in this period, I mean, I, well, what about, you know, in this time, I, what, our question, the first question I want to ask is, put on the table is, is it just like 1950 to 19, whatever, 1981, that's where I'm, I'm drawing the line. Was that one period in India's history and 1981 to today, is that a second period? I'd like to say no. After 1981, while this basic factor remained true, that we'd, we'd moved into a world in which to the extent that we can, at different points of time, we are going to exploit our access to foreign exchange on demand, there were three phases which we went through. The first phase is the 1980s. And actually, we know that, you know, even though in 1985 we already had Mr. Rajiv Gandhi and, you know, we were talking about taking India to the 21st century, we're talking about the need to liberalize for that, the London Economist was writing editorials about the tiger uncaged and so on and so forth, but we know that, you know, that there is a liberalization which was post-1991, which was very different from the liberalization which we had in the 1980s, in particular the liberalization which we had after the mid-1980s. What was the difference? Simply put, much of it in the 1980s was domestic liberalization, 
I mean, you got rid of excessive licensing, you had broadbanding, you had, you know, uh, re-endorsement of licenses, I mean, of capacities which had been unlicensed and so on and so forth. And starting from the mid-1980s, we had some degree of liberalization of import policy. In particular, liberalization of import policy focusing on access not to final goods, which actually occurred in the beginning of, of 2000s because that's when we had to give up our quantitative restrictions because the balance of payments argument couldn't hold with the WTO any, anymore. We largely liberalized access to capital equipment and intermediates. That is, you basically told people to the extent that you, did, you, you allowed them to, that you could import these things and put them together in India and sell them as Indian goods. But tariffs were still quite high. We were reducing tariffs, but tariffs were still pretty, pretty high. So I'd say it was predominantly creeping and largely domestic liberalization, which we had in the 1980s. Now, therefore, if you go back and look at the regime of accumulation in the 1980s, I mean, you could be anybody. You could be Monte Kaluvalia, you could be Amio Bhakchi, you know, you could be anybody. If you ask them, why did we have a shift out of whatever you want to call it, the Hindu rate of growth, the Christian rate of growth, the Muslim rate of growth, you can call it anything because we have all of them in, the, in our country. You know? We don't have only Hindus, okay? But whatever you call it, okay, uh, that rate of growth, we moved to a rate of growth in the 1980s, everybody, you know, which was higher, significantly higher. We had got into the 5 to 6 percent range. And you ask any of them independent of their persuasions and they say, oh, that's because this government of India pump primed the system. We moved into a world when we had large fiscal deficits. And it was only then that we had started talking about fiscal deficits. You know, India never spoke of fiscal deficits. Even the IMF didn't. We used to speak of budget deficits, which are monetized deficits. And we used to speak of revenue deficits, deficits on the revenue account. There was no notion of the fiscal deficit which dominated any thinking, any literature. But at one point of time, we said, eh, the aggregate deficit is what matters, you know, not just that part which is monetized. Anyway, um, which also doesn't really matter according to me, but anyway, <laughs> you know. Uh, so, uh, so you had this thing that, uh, that you talk to these people and they say, the government just borrowed money, spent it. So if you look at the regime of accumulation, it was just an intensified version of the regime of accumulation which you unsuccessfully pursued in the period up to 1980. At that point of time, you tried to pursue it. Every time you excess spent, creating a higher rate of non-agricultural growth, you first had inflation. When you tried to resolve the problem by allowing inflation to spill over into the balance of payments with, by importing stuff with, and having a larger current account deficit, you had a foreign exchange crisis. Okay? So therefore, you couldn't do it. But now you said you could do it. Why? You spent, you borrowed and spent. You still are... There's nothing wrong in borrowing and spending. It doesn't automatically lead to inflation, as we all know, hopefully. Uh, but the point is, if you have a supply-side constraint, which we have in agriculture, because you didn't do your institutional change, you can end up with an agricultural commodity-driven price increase and then an inflation. And when that occurs, you, should try to, you, you try to import. And when you import, you don't run into a balance of payments crisis because you pick up a telephone and call Washington, Tokyo, City of London, whatever it is, get the foreign exchange to finance it. For every rupee you borrowed domestically, you borrowed a few paise, maybe 20 paise, 30 paise, whatever it may be, depending upon your import propensities from the international market, had a higher rate of growth with no inflation. Magic. You know, when, when the United States got a higher rate of growth with no inflation, uh, in the period between the Second World War and the mid-1960s, they said it's a new paradigm of, 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 of capitalist uh, accumulation, you know. So we had it. We had it in the 1980s. We were getting it because of the fact that we used this access to foreign exchange. So the first point I want to make is, if you take the period of the 1980s, there was a fundamental change in terms of India's relationship with international capital, in particular now international finance, because we were accessing bank capital, it was the state which was accessing a large part of this bank capital. There was a large amount of state private sector borrowing. There was state borrowing from the private commercial bank market. But if you look at the regime of accumulation I'm trying to argue, it was not different. It's just that it didn't run up against a crisis. It didn't run up against the twin constraints of the agricultural constraint and the balance of payments constraint because the binding constraint, which is the balance of payments constraint, could be relaxed by using or exploiting your access to foreign exchange on demand. 
But obviously, you can do that for a little while. And unfortunately, you were a country which was doing it late. So that by the time we got to 1990, we were in a world in which, uh, if you look at it in terms of debt GDP ratios overall, debt GDP, external debt GDP ratios, debt service ratios, whether you cal calculate it in terms of the current account, you know, I mean, re receipts or you calculate it in terms of just merchandise exports, we were by no means anywhere in the league of developing countries internationally of being on the wrong side. I mean, you know, we had a, I think, if I remember right, we had a 20% external debt GDP ratio in, 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 in 1990. But that's, that's not a disaster, okay? But you had a significant current account deficit, and one of the things you needed was you needed to keep getting access to money to be able not only to meet the payments which are due on all the liabilities which you're building up from borrowing abroad, from accessing this, this foreign exchange on demand, but in addition to meet that current account deficit. So you needed a consistent or constant or, or sort of consecutive rollover of debt plus additional debt in order to be able to meet. Not only do you need to have that stock of debt, you needed to actually be in a position where you'd be able to meet your debt service commitments as well as cover your current account deficit. And things began to change because by then international banks and non-resident Indians who follow international banks because they only bring their money to get interest. They don't bring their money to build capital in this country, as you know. And when they came, I mean, like for example, this last year, if you take financial year 2011, 2012, much of the increase in, I mean, I, will, I think uh, according to the June 29th release of the Reserve Bank of India, more than 50%, I think, if I, uh, of the increment in India's, uh, of, the, of the variation in reserves, which is a decline, you know, it would have been, it would have been 50% worse, but for the fact that we got non-resident deposits, because in December last year, or November last year, the RBI decided to completely liberalize Interest, rate, interest rates on non-resident rupee, rupee deposits. And therefore, these people are willing to take a bet. There's a depreciating rupee, but they're willing to take a bet, put money in here, so that they get a higher rate of interest, 9.25% if you hold it for 365 days or more. 9.25% by international standards is an incredible rate of interest for one year. But you might get a 15% or 20 or 18% depreciation, but they're willing to take the bet and put their money here. And... Um, because they have the right to take it away before 365 days and they don't lose anything. You just don't get your 9.25%, that's all. So, you know, it's, it's, it's virtually you don't lose, but, you know, you can win. So, all these people started pulling back their money or being unwilling to roll over or taking back a part of the money they'd given. And therefore, in 1991, we got to a situation where we had, what, two weeks worth of uh, foreign reserves in terms of the ability to finance imports. Now, there's a whole argument that even that crisis didn't warrant us. Some people who are severe say even going to the IMF, people like, not, not raving radicals, huh? I.S. Gulati. I.S. Gulati said, listen, you're being foolish not accepting the dirhams and the dinars and so on, which people were bringing back from the Gulf because of the Gulf War, because Indian banks were scared that they wouldn't be able to convert this into dollars or gold. Because they said this currency is going to disappear because that, that region has got into such a big conflagration that nobody is going to believe in their currencies anymore. It was an absurd position to take. They were sitting on oil, you know. I mean, <laughs> worse comes to worse, the Americans would have taken over the oil and, you know, sold it and given you back your dirhams or your dinars, you know. Whatever it may be. He said that you didn't take that money and uh, if you had taken that money, you wouldn't have had a balance of payments crisis because they were all coming back because of the Gulf War and coming back with their savings. And if you just let them come and deposit their savings into your accounts, they would have come. I mean, they would have actually given you foreign exchange, which is good. Anyway, they didn't do that. But we know that we won. And there are others who are not so severe who said, okay, even if you had to go to the IMF, you didn't go. They need to go for 5 billion SDRs, you know. You could have gone for a billion maybe, 2 billion maybe. Your conditionalities would have been different. But by then, the world was different. It was not conditionalities which 
were being imposed and which were secret and which had to come out in terms of a, of a, of a leak, they were, they were on the IMF website and it was said that, listen, IMF is not asking us to do anything which you're not already doing. This is our growth strategy. So if they're going to give us an access to a 5 billion SDR line of credit, credit to do what we want to do, what's the problem? And therefore, we started seeing the second phase of our...